tonight, our demonstrator is Gary Rose, and he's going to um, answer your questions about photography and printing and give you a, a talk about fine art photography also for a little bit. So uh, Gary's a longtime professional photographer. He's uh, worked in the commercial photography field and the fine art photography field for uh, over 20 years. And uh, if there is something about photography that Gary doesn't know, I would be shocked. So <laughs> if I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you, you can learn more about Gary on his website at photosbyrose.com. So without further ado, Gary Rose. Hey, Gary. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about photography as an art form, and then we can go into uh, my brains on this play. And this is uh, purely my opinion of things. So if you don't agree, I would welcome you to say so and discuss it. I won't get mad if you tell me I'm <laughs> full along. So here we go. Um, I'm just going to give you my thoughts on this subject. Uh, so. I don't consider all photography art. I mean, there's all kinds of photography, and I would never say just blanket that photography is an art form, but there are some groups of photography that I consider to be art forms. Uh, so, you know, there's a documentary photography, which is like um, selfies, vacations, family events. But those aren't art, right? Uh, commercial photography, it can be artistic. It takes a lot of uh, artistic and uh, creative thought to do commercial photography, but I don't really consider it an art form because it has a it has a predetermined purpose to it, and it's usually not just for what it is. It has an ulterior motive, so I don't call that art of it. Uh, it can be artistic if you took it out of context. Some of it is very clever. Uh, okay, so uh, photography is really popular. I would say it's extremely popular, like art or craft or whatever. And uh, so I started thinking about why it's so popular. And uh, it saves memories. It uh, captures fun moments. Kids like it. Um, selfies. And um, nowadays, because of it being digital, you get instant feedback so you can see if you did things, which is really gratifying to get that instant feedback. And the number one reason, gadgets. Guys love gadgets. And you can spend so much money on photography and gadgets and lenses. And that's what's one of the things that makes it popular is you can buy all these gadgets. Uh, anyway, here is my definition of what makes a photograph art. Two words, vision and execution. So vision, I, I'm going to say, think of me saying this about myself, but I think it applies in general, but I'm thinking, I'm saying this about myself. Um, you notice things differently than most people do. You, you walk down the street and you notice things that the average person doesn't see just because it's noise like And um, that could be uh, details. I mean, I tend to notice little things that aren't part of the big picture. They get lost because they're little details. Um, you could be uh, noticing the big picture. Most people walk down in their, their line of vision and somebody can back up and say, wow, look at this whole valley. So whatever your vision is, it's got to it, it's going to be something that isn't mainstream. It's got to be a little offbeat or people won't notice it. It's not going to be, you know, anybody sees it that way. You want to be able to see something differently than the majority of people see. Um, beauty in the most mundane is 
one of the things that I like to say. If you look at, I mean, who would take pictures of beat up trash cans? <laughs> All right, um, so vision is the next, you're, you're seeing things, big picture, little picture, different. When you see an image, it speaks to you. It, like, wow, that's kind of cool. Like, this is my favorite example. I'm walking around, this was at the uh, uh, Transportation Museum, and I don't, this is one of my favorite pictures and I can't explain why it is. It just, it talks to me, and I don't really know why. Show it to the camera here. Okay. Um, so, when you see an image that speaks to you, you take the picture, and it isn't a snapshot. You have to, to make it really an art form, and you're not just walk along and put the camera. You know, I took half a dozen pictures of this, standing up, laying down, sitting to the right, to the left, until I found what was just the right thing. So usually, you might get lucky with the first shot, but if you want to be successful at it, you kind of have to work at it. You have to play with it a little bit to get what you like. And uh, the other thing about an image speaking to you is, I'm a commercial photographer. Commercial photographers get this assignment like, okay, we have toilet bowls, make one look sexy for a picture. I mean, th this is the kind of challenge a commercial photographer gets, is he's got to be creative, and a lot of times you build an image for them. You set up a set to take the picture. Some of my pictures, these three in particular, were built. I, they, this took me about two weeks to set it up to get this ready to go for this This was just an hour or so I set it up for a show. Um, so I visualized these pictures in my head and then I proceeded to build it or make it to my vision. Okay. Yeah, the execution, the other part. Um, it should take work to do, because if it doesn't take work, anybody can walk up and flip the same picture, and what's the point? It has to have your input into it, your spin to it, to make it yours, instead of anybody walking by to the picture. Um, the framing, the exposure, the lighting, all of those things need to be considered, played with, experimented with until you find just the right thing. You don't want to just click. You gotta, it's not, you're not giving your subject the effort it's due if you just click the picture. It's got to be worth working at. Okay. Um, so my goal when I'm trying to produce a piece of art is it should visually stand alone. What I want any of these pictures to do is just be sitting there. That is a photograph. It's not a Photoshop in any way. I want it to be visually stand alone. That is, if I hang it on the wall with no explanation or description, it will still attract your attention and you're still going to walk up to it and be interested. Some pictures say, so why did they take this? And you read underneath of it, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. That, to me, in my personal attempt, would be a failure, because I want it to be, there it is, wow, maybe what is it or whatever, but you like the picture for what it is without an explanation. Or at least it attracts your attention. You may not necessarily like it, but at least you're curious about it without any kind of uh, explanation to it. Of course, you can add the explanation after the fact, but I want the image um, I wanted to have an unusual perspective or subject, some sort of something to be catchy, unusual, different, at your eye. Um, be technically well executed, and 
sometimes that requires a, uh, a good handle on the technical part of your photography. This was a real challenge. I'll explain to you how I did that, but that was a very technically challenging picture to take. Uh, probably the most difficult one I've taken, just for fun. Um, and hopefully memorable to an audience. I walk away, somebody's going to talk about it or something. Um, and the side effect of all of this, I'm almost done here, the side effect of doing all of this is it leads me to new ideas. Like when I'm working on this, I'm sitting there thinking, hey, you know, I could, and I get other ideas. So the immersion of really getting into building the photograph, taking the picture, printing it, getting it just the way you want it, sort of leads to other inspirations of what you do or what you and um, it hones your technical skills in photography. If you see an image that you want to take, either in your mind or in front of you, sometimes if it's challenging, you need to tweak your technical expertise to be able to achieve what you're trying to do. And that's a good thing, because the more you are challenged, the better you get the skills to require to take pictures. So this is. What I wanted to show you is these are pictures that were shot purely for art purposes. Um, I have a whole series of these eggs, I just brought two of them. And the reason I have a whole series of them is to prove to people that it wasn't just a lucky shot, that I could do it anytime I wanted to. So I have about a dozen different shots that I have this. This is a raw egg yolk the instant it hits the fork. It's a raw egg dropping, and I have my here. It is just hit the fork, and a fraction of a second later, it's just mush falling down the side. Same way with this one. It's just, and you can see up here in the air, is a piece of egg white that's mid-fall also. Did you drop that out of the game? So, to achieve this, these pictures, I built a framework. I had a friend of mine modify a garage door opener beam, you know, the kind of beam that you break and it stops the garage door. But we reversed it so that when you broke the beam, it would set off my flashes, my strobes. But of course, there were all these technical problems because those beams aren't meant to have some whip through it real fast. So at first, I was dropping into the beam and the beam wasn't responding quickly enough to make it. So I had a lot of tinkering, I had to make the beam smaller, and then I had to raise the beam up and down so that the reaction time was just right, so that, say the beam is up here, and by the time the egg hits here to break the beam, and the flash goes off, it has already fallen this far. So I start out, here's the thing up here, I start out, it's already in the floor, and I had to tweak the beam to where it would fire my strokes and just the right side. Now, you get it so fast, if you turn your strobe up really high to be bright, the flash lasts longer is what it does. Well, when you're trying to catch something like this, you don't want the flash to be long because it will actually blur because this is moving so fast. So I had to use multiple flashes all turned down low so that they would put out a lot of light, but be really quick instead of one putting out a big blast. There was a bunch of them putting out little blasts all at once, so that they were really quick to catch. So I was going to say, how many eggs did you use? What? How many eggs? Oh, everybody asks that question. <laughs> First of all, I started out with a little ball of yarn that I was dropping to set the trigger to try it. The yarn wasn't falling as fast as the egg would because it was too light. So then I went to a little rubber ball, and that worked pretty well so that I could set the beam. And then I had trouble to take these pictures. You had to be in total darkness because the camera won't react quickly enough. So I would have to be in total darkness and open the camera and open. 
total darkness. Why don't open, you put those on the open tripod? Open the camera. Put the egg pictures on the tripod. Okay. Open the camera, then in total darkness, go drop the two, drop the egg in a funnel on the top and let it go down. It fires the strobe, and then I go close my camera and turn on the lights and see what I've got. So that was one of the problems. Another problem is I learned from hard experience that when I used the same fork a second time, I didn't wash it, and all the slop from the last picture showed up. <laughs> so I had this jelly roll pan, and eggs on one side, and a whole row of forks like you're ready to use. Drop an egg, put that fork away, put a cotton fork in, and do it again. Because I've got pictures I didn't bring the, of the yolk, but some big slime on here from the last picture that I didn't think of. So that was another thing I had to learn the hard way. But uh, it was a, a challenge. How many do you have in that series? You said you have I probably have about a dozen images. Yeah. Some of them are just smeared down the oh, fork. Yeah, it's just all kinds of different. I used, this was an accident, but it was an interesting effect. I went out to get another batch of eggs, and then another batch of eggs I had, the yolk was much darker, it was almost orange, because I guess they were fed something. Yeah. So some of my images actually have yolks that are different shades of yellow. So this is a, a blue background, and I have strokes underneath. Picture this is the table. This thing is on it. I've got two strobes under here, hitting a blue backdrop to light this up. And that's how it's uh, tapered in brightness to the bottom. Is there's a strobe down here, and as it goes up, it loses its brightness. So that's how I got the light taper on there. And then I had two strobes set low, one on either side, to catch this, because I was finding out that one strobe was taking too long and more damage. I had to use two in a short That was fun. Any guesses? I could guess. Any guess, but there's... I have a whole series of these, too. And there's someone who's playing. What it is, you would guess? Yes. Uh, and that's part of this thing. So blueberry, a bowl of a lot strawberry and toss. This is oil on water, and the oil beads up and makes lenses. And under all of this are M&Ms, and the M&Ms are providing the color. Even all of this color and this brightness, this is like a bubble, and because it's a bubble, it acted like a lens, and it focused on a yellow M&M that was underneath, where the rest of these are just M&Ms that are out of focus, and that's where the color and it's oil floating on water in a uh, casserole dish. Oh, that's pretty cool. Somebody's cooking oil. Yeah, there's I tried a bunch of different oils. And, uh, oil and water over MMs. Oil and water, what? Oil and water over MMs. Yes. And somebody's face. Somebody's face? Yeah, it's too yeah, right. right. Oh, here? Yeah. Oh, a ghost image. You know what? That's probably me taking the picture. And I never noticed that before. I'm a ghost in there. Yeah, I think it is. And it must be. But it, it looks like a ghost. Yeah, it does. And it's because I'm leaning over the dish like this. And I never noticed that before. Maybe it's just coming out because it's getting close to home. That could be it. That's spooky. Yeah. That's pretty spooky. So how about this one? You guys want to guess what that one is? Uh, you're saying that's more M&M's? <laughs> 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 soap suds in the sink. No, soap suds yeah. in, in the sink. You know, like you were going to do dishes. It's all frothed up. And by changing my focus, I could focus down through the bubbles or reflections on the bubbles and what I have. And then I put 
a yellow kind of something up here to catch this tone so that it wasn't all monochromatic. So it's picking up reflections in the room, and all they are is soap bubbles in the sink. Mm -hmm. on top and they're shining down through the pan and there are M&Ms underneath and you're seeing the M&Ms. All the color comes from M&Ms. Yep. Wow. And part of that is because this is a macro picture. It's not like, oh, it's this big and the M&Ms are this big. This would probably be the size of an M&M. So it's, it's confusing that the M&Ms are actually pretty big in the image because it's a macro image. researching this for a book that it was in, I found out that that spotlight is still functional and every once in a while they turn it on and play with it. And it was from the World's Fair. Yeah, so there's And then this is part of the thing where I went through the transportation museum and just found weird things. I mean, who, who would take a picture of a broken hose. No, no, <laughs> it's a brake cable hydraulic hose to a railroad car that was dangling. And I liked how it was a swirl. Looks like a dancer. Yeah. 
So this, this is my point of seeing things that the average person doesn't see or seeing it in a way that the average person doesn't see. Yes, sir? That's what artists do to you. Well, that's my whole point. That's exactly that's my, my point. I agree totally. Same philosophy. Yes. And the other thing that I'm going to say painters, because there are all kinds of artists, but painters and photographers, when I got my degree in photography, we studied semesters of painters and their methods and their rules of thirds and the brightness and the darkness. Photography, for instance, landscape photography and everything, it is an imitation of painting. Literally, painting was around way before photography was. And we had to learn all the classic composition and color and various artists to apply it to photography. So, yeah, I am not denigrating or, uh, painting at all. I, I wish I had the talent to do that myself. Okay, so that is my spiel. Oh, one more thing. I think I have 15 copies of this. Amy said that you guys, this is instructions on how to photograph flat art that I have given talks on before. You probably had one from last time. like a Leica. It's got a little window that you look through and it has interchangeable lenses and it's digital. See, that's what I need to know. Maybe not, I'm not the only one I need to know. So price range of cameras that would do a good work because they got everything you can think of, low end to high end. Yeah. And the problem now from my own personal viewpoint is that all the they've already perfected the photography side of the cameras to the point that they don't know what else to do with them. So now they're coming out with um, Bluetooth and GPS and all of this. That has really nothing to do with photography, but they have to figure out something else to add to a camera. So they're adding things like that to the camera. It doesn't really add to the functionality of the camera from the photography. Yes. Do you do you print your own work? Yes, I do. What kind of printer do you use? I have a Canon. What is it? Ten. They have. A, it, the one I have is in the middle. Um, there's a high end, a middle, and a lower one. It uh, it's like it's D5 or no, it's a ten Canon, ten D or D10, something like that. And it has. Uh, Eight ink cartridges. How many? Eight. And the reason I chose that one is it has three white, gray, black inks so that it'll do a better job. It's advertised as doing a better job in printing black and white, which I'm most interested in. Doing. It 
it's sort of tweaked towards doing a good job of black and white printing. Do you do standard uh, photo paper? Yep. Yes, they do. And your lights? Your lights are on this type of lights. I have bunches of different kinds of lights. I would I use strobes, but I would recommend that if you guys don't have six hundred dollar piece strobes, that you just use um, the. Uh, you go to Lowe's and you buy either an LED or the worm lights, I call them. But on the back of the package, you can buy them in different colors, different color ranges in the spectrum. So what you want is there will be a little chart or a little bar on the back. You want it to be as far to the right as you can, which will be the highest number. It will be like. 5,600 instead of on the left is 3,400. The 3,400 ones will look like a tungsten light bulb. It'll be really yellow. The ones way off to the right look almost like a bright sunny day. And those are the ones you want. And it's weird to walk into a room. You'll, you'll look in a hallway and you'll see that light on. It's like, wow, they must have the window open. The sun is coming in there somewhere. And it's these bulbs that look like daylight. So the higher the number, the better off. Correct. So this is a weird thing between artists and engineers. Because I used to be an engineer. I was an optical engineer. In the engineering world and in the physics world, the colder things are, the more red and orange they are. And the hotter they are, the more blue they are. This is the part, this is what God made it, you know? And then to the artists and the photographers, it's the opposite. Warm is orange and yellows and reds, and cools are blue, which is just like this. So, yeah. so the light bulbs of the higher numbers are actually bluer or closer to it. And then you're going to use a, they'll still, if you just use a, some cameras, on my Canon cameras, it, if you didn't color correct it, even those lights would have kind of a greenish cast to them. So what you want to do to make sure you're doing this right is it's written in there to do your custom white balance. Are you guys familiar with doing that on your cameras? There's a setting where you take a picture of a white card and you basically tell the camera this is white and the camera looks at it and says, ah, oh, well I have to correct it because the light is making it look yellow or green, and it will correct it and make white look white. Mm. And that will give you the most accurate. You know, you have the automatic white balance, which does a pretty fair job, but if you're really going to be photographing artwork or something, you want the color to be as accurate as you can, use the custom white balance. And the other thing on my camera, mine's a pretty high-end camera, and it has a lot of interesting features that I'm realizing that other cameras don't have. But on mine, I have different settings that I can change the saturation of a color. So there's like three or four different saturation levels. And one will like, all right, it's going to look about the way it was. Another one, it's going to be a little softer, like more pastel. So if you have something that's really contrasty, It'll tone the color and the sharpness down. And then I have another one that just like punches things. It looks like crayons. And if you have that feature in your camera, you should try to get the most realistic color balance that you can. Because if I don't watch that on my camera, I could take a picture of your things and they could look day glow. I mean, it's really outrageously colorful by having it on the wrong color saturation setting. So some of the better cameras have a saturation adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. It is. In fact, when I did this, I kind of turned the saturation up like that. So is there any other questions about the uh, copying artwork or with the artwork try to use two lights one on either side so that you don't get a hot spot 
the light should be the same angle, same distance away, same light bulb as the either side, so you don't get a color shift or a brightness shift on the image. That's all I can think of. Make sure your camera is level and straight. But see, if you, if you back up and leave room around your image, which I say not to do in there, but cross that out, and it's a little crooked, you can straighten that, or you can make a print and fix that. And it will also, your lens is sharper in the middle than it is out in the corners, and so you keep the image in a little closer so that the bad part of the lens isn't affecting your image. And it's important to measure that stick out from the I want it to be as straight as you can. So that's got to be the same distance. Yes. So that um, so if you had a wall like in your basement or something that you could just leave that set up. That's what I do. Yeah. Okay. So you would have an X on the wall, you know, a spot, and you know that that's the center. So whenever you hang your stuff, you make that the center. You know that's where it is. And now. <laughs> When you have your camera on a tripod, hopefully, put your little marks on the floor, and when you're ready to set it up, you just drop the tripod right okay, where it was, nice. and, yeah. and you can repeat your setup easily. Yes, sir. I was going to say, nothing else can use tape. Put the tape down, sure. let it where it's at, the camera can roll right there from the same yep, distance. Exactly. And you can put marks on it so you know how far away it is. Yes. On your sketch, you show floodlight. What type of floodlight? Well, that's what I was just talking about. Just lights from uh, Lowe's. Okay. And I use these work lights. They cost like six bucks with a spring clamp right. on them. Yeah, they're all the type lights in them. What? The LEDs inside of those, right? Well, there's nothing in them right then. You buy your own light. No, I mean, what the ones you put in. Well, about yeah, them. yeah, either yeah. one. Anything that's. And when you buy them, make sure they're way off on the hot end of the the hot, which is the blue end of the spectrum. Right. Yeah. Okay. What, what about having a fluorescent light above? Yeah. I have the two floodlights on the side. Yeah. Fluorescent light. Well, in the ceiling. Yeah, I understand. I would turn them off if I could. Turn it off. I mean, if you got the floods on, you'll be able to see the works. Okay. Picture. All right. I have two lights that I bought. There's a little, little simple about white balance or what I custom, the camera. Custom white balance. They didn't uh, I didn't buy the book and now they say it's too late to buy the book. I bet you can find it online. I've tried. Really? Which camera is it? Well it's just a shoot camera. It's a a Sony XP six twenty. So it's a little point and shoot kind of camera? Yeah, it's got the it's got all kinds of features, but I don't know how to use any of them. Yeah, that's tough. Without the book. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you about that. Because the custom white balance is kind of important if you want to reproduce the color. Right? Every once in a while, something comes up about white balance on it. I just keep pushing it. Well, most cameras will have a set of pre-programmed white balances, like. Um, my, you'll have a, there'll be a little picture of a barn with a shade, and that means open shade. And then there'll be a picture of clouds, and that means this is for cloudy days. And then there'll be one that'll look like a little light bulb, and that's tungsten. And so if you're going to shoot in a room that has regular light bulbs in it, what it does is it makes the image real blue to compensate for the yellow light. So there's several of these. As a professional photographer, it's just, you'll be in a room 
and you do the white balance, you know, you got it down. And they're like, oh, can you come outside and get this picture out on the front porch or something? And either you're going to forget to change it when you take that picture, or you're going to change it and forget to change it back when you come in. Mm -hmm. But that is just the color balance is just the one thing that photographers always forget to, to straighten out. It's just, it drives us crazy. I think you could. Try, yes, try, I was going to say, try Sony manuals. Oh. Look up Sony manuals first. Look up Sony manuals and then put the camera in and see what happens. Then yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. I'll bet you can find it. Yes, sir. On this floodlights, it'd be 5,000 plus LED lights. Uh, use as much voltage or I think they have a different set no, of they, the LEDs. No, the bulbs will, if you are using, they haven't gotten around. It's like saying a 35 millimeter camera, and cameras aren't 35 millimeter anymore. But you still use that as a as a standard. To the same thing is happening with light bulbs. If you have a hundred watt light bulb, watt is how much energy the light bulb would take. It isn't how bright it is technically. It's how much energy it puts out. Well, the new ones say, well, this is the equivalent of a hundred watt bulb. But it's 13 watts. Yeah. But what they're saying is it's putting out as much light as a 100 watt light bulb used to put out. So you won't have any problem with, you know, when you're saying 5,000 um, K, which is, what is that? It's, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, um, light temperature. Yeah, but it, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, Kelvin. Kelvin. 5,000 Kelvin. Kelvin. But it's not the power output at all. It's like 13 watts. It's nothing. It's like. Well, now they're going by lumens anyway. Well, lumens is a different thing. Lumens is how bright something is. Kelvin is what color it is. is would you look at the lumens then to get that brighter end of the spectrum? Well, you want to look at the, the Kelvins because that's telling you what color it is. Oh, okay. So here's that interesting bit of trivia that will never need to know, but when they talk about Kelvin for color of a light bulb, where that comes from is in the Bureau of Standards in France and in the United States or something, they have a tungsten wire, and this tungsten wire, they put electricity through, just like a light bulb, you had a wound up tungsten wire in a light bulb. They put this tungsten wire and they run it up to a given temperature, and then they see what color it is, what color of light it's emitting, because it's so hot, it's going, it's like the filament of a light bulb, it is. So what that Kelvin means is how hot that piece of tungsten wire is to produce that color of light, and that's how they standardize it. It's, how do I know what color it is? Well, it's a piece of tungsten wire raised to this temperature, and that's what color it's going to emit if you raise it to that. So that's where that Kelvin comes from. It's a temperature of how hot the wire has to be to emit that color of light. Yeah, what also might help is a lot of the hardware stores will have a, a light display along that, and yeah. bulbs are different colors. Exactly. And you can kind of look at the different colors. And look at the package idea. on the back. Right. Like that. Right. Okay. Some of them are like a yellow, some of them are off-white. Yep. Seems like they're all on the, they're all on the light yep. bulbs. Yeah, now Lowe's has that mm -hmm. display like that. And you want it, they usually start on the left, on the left being uh, the cooler, more yellow, and as you move to your right when you're looking at the display, the ones on the far right are usually the whitest and the coolest. Yes? If you're going to have a wall about that size and you're going to put up all your paintings on that wall, how would you like that? For display, yeah. long term or just for show? Long term. Oh, long term. Okay. I would probably try to use some sort of indirect lighting, like hit the ceiling and come down on it so that it would be soft and diffused. You wouldn't have any hot spots. So they have hand lights perhaps, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They come down from the ceiling and then, but I would 
try to get them reflected or diffused instead of a hot spot on your art. You would shine, say, spotlights on the pictures um, the painting. I know that galleries do that, even Amy does that information. Those are special bulbs and they have to be lined up right for reflection purposes. So if you have glass over your image, um, you could wind up getting an image of your light in it, whatever. It, it's definitely nice and dramatic to have a nice spotlight showing your work. Uh, some bulbs you have to watch because it will actually affect your picture, it will fade your picture, especially photographs, they'll fade if they have a light on them all the time. And red especially. Their color red, red you mean? Yeah. 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 So that's kind of why I would try not to put a spotlight directly on the painting. I would rather have it diffused because of that purpose. And if you have glass over it, you're less likely to have a glare problem. Unless you're an expert like Amy over there. <laughs> but in the gallery at Framations, the lights are up really high, so the angle of the light hitting the work is pretty steep. It's not down to where you're going to get a reflection on it. It's kind of. And keep in mind, this is all my opinion. I'm not necessarily an expert on any of these things. That's just my opinion. Um, I had some lights in a tent at a festival sort of display mm -hmm. and um, I saw something online about taking um, the, the paper that um, you put inside of the uh, pans or inside of a punch pan. Okay. But, but if it's especially for baking, mm -hmm. it goes at really high temperature. Right. And I just put the lights to try and diffuse it. Okay. Yeah. So an umbrella works. A white they photo umbrellas. They're not very expensive. And they uh, diffuse the light and don't add color to it. They don't deflect the color. So you might use an umbrella. Cross of the tent, so that would be interesting to try and get an umbrella. Oh well, yeah, I was thinking of lighting up some of the picture. Any other questions for the famous scary book? No. How about a huge round of applause? Right, thank you. Thank you. most important thing with photography if you could and pass that knowledge on to our members what would be the one thing that they that, that you really want them to take away tonight well i think that this would apply to you as painters are photographers is just notice the world around you pay attention to what's going on around you absorb it and translate that into a photograph or a painting or your memory or a sketch but notice the little things yeah. How much would you sell those for? Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason is because we see when we're I'm, I've been investigating different art shows, and some places you'll see something for seventy five, up to whatever, and if yeah. mid range somewhere. Yeah. And that look like a mid range. They look like they might be about a hundred apiece. Well, it just depends on the artist and. I sell them for different prices according to what size they are too, because I yeah, have that, bigger images of them too. I usually let Amy advise and we discuss that <laughs> okay. when I put them up in the gallery. Did, did you tell yeah. them that a lot of the pieces that you have up there are from your portal series? That's exactly right. I I had a book. You can buy the book. It's not a very impressive book, but it's a book that I did a, a, a one man show at the gallery and it was portals, which could be just about anything once I got into it. it. It included trees out in the west where there was a road going through the middle of the tree where they drove through the tree, um, arches, 
all these different kind of staircases. They, I, any windows, doors, bridges, and uh, these were part of the portals to show the people. Part the beautiful show. Do you do people? Do I do people? Yeah, look at my website. My website is full of people. Do you do portraits or people? Do you ever put people in your pictures? It depends. I mean, I do a lot. I like taking pictures of people, uh, but I don't have any of them on display at the gallery because I don't know why anyone would want to buy a picture of a stranger. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, I do like taking pictures of people. I, you know, in fact, I teach a class at uh, St. Rose Community College on uh, portrait photography. Do you have any classes currently going or upcoming that you'd like to mention? Uh, most of the classes won't start till January. Do you know what classes you'll be teaching in January and where? Uh, my favorite class is the art of photography, and that's where I teach people how to do this kind of stuff. And that's a pretty popular class. Is that at the community college? Yes. Which community? Is it Charles? Community college. Exactly. Great. Well, a huge round of applause for Gary. Thank you very much. Think about Gary. <laughs> <laughs>Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.